Come on, what's up, Reach Church? Becca, you do so good at that. I did like it a little bit better, though, when they went, ah, and scared you. I'm just going to be honest with you. I do miss the little cowbell and the little Dakota's big head popping into the screen. We need to add that back in just for fun, uh, just because. Anybody got their cowbell today? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I was like, wow. And we're down to one. That's good. That's cowbells fading. This is not a good thing. Well, I'm excited this morning. Um, Pastor Chad, as you know, uh, Sarah's not feeling well, so keep her in your prayers. Um, obviously, they have not tested positive, positive, positive. I guess I'm speaking a different languages now. Uh, positive for COVID or anything like that. She just wasn't feeling, feeling well, so out of abundance of caution, uh, Pastor thought it'd be good that they stayed home today. He had already had a friend of his uh, scheduled to speak, so we are excited to hear what he has to say. Um, so if you guys would stand to your feet, he has been the executive pastor for the last five years at Victory Life Church in Sherman, Texas, I believe that is. And so if you guys would give it up for Mr. Seth Swindoll as he comes and gives the word of God. <laughs> Thank you. How is everybody this morning? All right. So I heard that you guys had the answer to the world's problems. A little more cowbell? Yeah. I love it. So you won't bother me. I like it when you preach back at me. Um, I learn some things when the crowd preaches back to me. So, so talk to me. Let me know. Help me out this morning as we get into the message. I, Pastor Chad is a new friendship for me. And we met probably a few months ago. And a, a mutual friend of ours had us both in to have a conversation about the Holy Spirit. And Chad and I hit it off, and I, man, I just love your pastor. I've only been around him just really a handful of times, but it doesn't take long when you meet people of integrity and people of God to see God in them and to see God coming through them. And I just want you to know you're very blessed and you're very fortunate to have pastors. Your pastors are an expression of God's love to you. And I want to encourage you to be grateful for Pastor Chad and Pastor Sarah because they truly were sent by God to serve you and as an expression of his love for you. Can we celebrate them this morning? Amen. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to jump right into the message this morning. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. You are faithful. Right now we do. We lift up Pastor Chad and Pastor Sarah to you. We thank you that your healing power flows through their bodies, through their minds. We thank you that they are healthy and strong emotionally, spiritually, physically, and in every area of their life, God. We just thank you for, for ministering to them this morning and that, Father, they are refreshed and regenerated and ready to come back and tackle everything that you've placed in front of them. And I just thank you for Reach Church. And God, this truly is a church that is reaching into a community, into a city to make a difference on your behalf. We honor you and we're so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen. Well, we are in the middle of a series, Weird, because normal isn't working. And I, I love that. I love that, talking to Pastor Chad about that. And so we're going to talk about some things this morning that will make you a little bit weird, but don't have to make you crazy. Okay? There's some things that God wants to put into our life that will make us weirdly different, but they won't make us weirdly crazy. Okay? And that's a good. We've all got the crazy family member, you know, that we've been social distancing from for a long time <laughs> before COVID. Um, a few years ago, my family and I, my mother-in-law showed up at the house and she wanted to take the family to a carnival. And uh, I have five daughters. It, it, yep. The power of God rests within me. Um, I've, I've heard pastors say that if you can raise a daughter, you can raise the dead. So I know that God must have something spectacular for me, having five daughters. But we loaded the family up. We went to the carnival, and we, we were walking around. We were eating different snacks and different things. And my second daughter loves roller coasters. Now, I hate roller coasters. I, I, I despise them. There's lots of stories I could tell about why I despise them. Um, but I, I do. And, and my daughter spied this ride. And she said, Dad, I want to I wanna ride this. And I kind of examined it for a second. And it wasn't a big deal. It's a little carnival. It wasn't like Six Flags. It wasn't like this big roller coaster. And I kind of examined it. And I said, okay, I, 
I can, I can do that. I can do that. My daughter wants to ride a ride. We're going to ride a ride. So let's, let's go. We got our tickets. My mother-in-law, my daughter, myself, we got in line. My, my twins, I've got twins that at the time were about three or four years old. And they're standing with, with mom. And my oldest, who's probably about 10 at the time, um, is, is, so they're all standing watching. And my, my daughter, who's about probably six or seven years old, you know, I've got her by the hand. We're in line, me, my daughter, my mother-in-law. We, we get up to there. They give us the instructions for the ride, and they get us on. And I just walk on like, man, this ain't no thing. This is going to be fun. And so it's one of these rides, like if, you, if we took one of your rows of chairs and just put it right across here, that's kind of how the ride was structured. So a person sat here, a person sat here, and we're all facing this way. A person sat here. So we walked on, and I sat down. I'm feeling good about myself, and my six-year-old daughter sits right next to me, and I'm like, baby, this is going to be so fun. You're going to love this. My mother-in-law sits over there, and he goes through the spill. The, the restriction or the, the cage or the, the harness comes down and bolts into place. He comes by and checks everything to make sure we're, we're good and tight. And he's like, is everybody ready? We're like, yeah, let's go. And it moves this way. It swings this way. I don't know, maybe you've seen this. And, and it kind of starts here and starts here, and it gets a little more and gets a little more. And then it kind of throws you on top. And I'd watched it. I, I knew what was coming. I knew I had it down. Um, and, and I'm like chilling, and I'm like, hey, there's my, there's my, my twins, my babies, and, and you having fun? Good, good, good. And that first, like, poof, where it went up, I went, <laughs> I hate this. 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 And I'm like, pick a point focus, you can make it through this. And I'm like, the whole time, I'm like, I want off this thing thing, I want off this thing thing. My six-year-old sitting next to me, she's hanging out like, hey, mom, hey, twins, hey, hey, nana, da, 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 da. And she looks and turns at me. Nana, I've got to go. Dad's scared, and I've got to help him. And turns to me, my six-year-old, it's going to be okay, Dad. We're going to get through this. You can make it just a little bit longer. And for the rest of the ride, I'm like, I can't touch you. I can't, I can't let go because I'm going to fly out. And she's like, it's going to be okay, Dad. It's gonna be. And for the rest of the ride, my six-year-old daughter consoles me. And I walked off in shame. And, and not to mention, did my six-year-old daughter notice that I was terrified, but my three-year-old twins noticed that I was terrified, and they're crying, Mom, go help Dad. He's scared. <laughs> and I tell you that story because I think a lot of us walked into 2020 like we got this. <laughs> this is going to be the best year ever. And that first, when we all went, I hate this. God, I hate this. Let's go back to 2019. <laughs> but, but God has given us something that might come in the shape of a six-year-old daughter called the Holy Spirit that will comfort us in the midst of our fear and will comfort us in the midst of our panic. It will lead us in the midst of our confusion. And today I want to talk about the holy what? Come on, say the holy what? Yeah, say it like that. Say the holy what? Like, what? And I think a lot of people have that question when we talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And they're like, the, the what? The Holy Ghost? The Holy Spirit? The Holy... That makes no sense to me. I don't understand that. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit will make you weirdly different, but doesn't have to make you weirdly crazy. Now, we all know some spirit-filled folk that teeter. Well, no, they don't teeter. They've just launched into the side of crazy. And, and, you know, yes, the Bible says Peter told us we are a peculiar people. That doesn't mean we have to be an unrelatable people. That we are to be different. Jesus said we are in the world, but we are not of the world. There should be something different about the way that we live. But we should be relatable. We should be able to communicate with people. We should be able to build relationships with people. And we should be attractive 
to say, man, there is something different about me that draws me to you, not repulses me and pushes me away from you. You know, there, there are things, if you look at, at, at people that live in extreme poverty and people that live in extreme wealth, there's a difference in how they live. And for the, the person that lives in poverty to step into the life of the person that has money, it's weird. It's like, uh, well, you do what? You buy groceries where? You have extra toilet paper? What? You know, it's, and, and, and then for the person that's, that's, that's living in wealth to step into the person that's living in poverty, it's, it's a weird difference. And the only thing that's different is that one person has something, the other one doesn't. And what makes us different is what God's placed on the inside of us. Now, I want you to know this. Chad, would you grab my water for me? I need a little, little drink. Yeah, cool. Either, either way, I don't care. Liquid, wet, it's okay. Um, what makes us different is what God has placed on the inside of us. And I want, you to, I want to start with this principle this morning. Is that how we represent God will determine how others relate to God. Because people will judge a God they can't see based on the people they can see. They can't see God. They don't understand this Holy Spirit, this God thing. This. And so when we say there's something in us, they're assuming that what, what's in us is affecting what's coming out of us. And they are, if you are a believer, if you've accepted Jesus, if you've exper experienced this Holy Spirit thing, how you're representing by your life, the Bible says that we are to taste and see that God is good. How do, the, how do people that can't see God, that, that don't feel, how do they see, how do they taste of God? They taste of our life. They taste of our behavior. They taste of our words. They taste of our attitudes. They taste of us in relationship. And they should be able to taste and see by the reflection of our life that God is good. Amen. And so how we relate to God will affect how others, or how we represent God will affect how others relate to God. And you know, I find it interesting that in the New Testament, People that were closest to Jesus were often the greatest obstacle to get to Jesus. I mean, children wanted to come to Jesus, and it was the people that were closest to him that said, no, 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 you don't bother Jesus, get away from Jesus. Jesus had to remove the obstacles so that the kids could get to him. The people that were closest to Jesus bombarded a house and filled the house so that someone that was sick, laying on a bed, paralyzed, couldn't get to him, and they had to bust a hole in the ceiling to get to him. And it's often sometimes the people in the church that are the greatest obstacle for people out of the church to get to Jesus. And, and I don't want to be that kind of Christian. I want to be people, I want to be a person that reflects God's character and God's love and God's kindness and God's mercy and God's grace and God's goodness and God's power in my life. But power doesn't equal crazy. The Holy Spirit will make you different, but it doesn't have to make you weird. We probably got a diversity of experiences in here. Some of you may have grown up in a conservative denomination that didn't teach the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the, power, uh, the Holy Spirit working in and through your life. Maybe they taught that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit were something that were just for the early church and have been done away with, and, and that's not a part of your life today. Maybe they, they taught you and how they represented God, and more importantly, how they represented the Holy Spirit is probably affecting your relationship with the Holy Spirit. It, it's maybe hard for you to come to a, a charismatic, spirit-filled church and feel comfortable because this is out of your norm. Now, maybe on the other extreme, there's people here that grew up in a very, what I would not call charismatic, but charismaniac um, church. <laughs> you know, and, and you, you, were, you were the church, you didn't like want to bring friends to that church because you knew that sister so-and-so about halfway through the third song was going to break out in tongues. And while she was doing that, she was knocking over about four rows of chairs. And the other sister so-and-so on the other side was getting the modesty cloth to bring over. And my, no, okay, we don't have any charismatic people in here that remember like the modesty cloth. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, in the middle of the message, you knew that brother so-and-so was going to have some kind of weird, weird something. And it was just sometimes weird. And I grew up in that kind of place. Good, 
loved God, and I, I'm, I'm convinced that you know, 90% of what I experienced that was maybe wrong was just immaturity and innocence of people wanting to pursue more of God and all of God. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 that when it comes to the issue of the Holy Spirit, we are to not be ignorant. Yet most of the church is ignorant when it comes to the issue of the Holy Spirit. The first five years of my life, I grew up in a conservative denomination that did not teach or believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And our pastor at that time had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to experience the things of God's Word and the Holy Spirit. And obviously that didn't go over well in a conservative denomination, and he didn't last very long. And so he stepped out, and, but he had given just enough seed and just enough teaching that it, had, it piqued the interest of, of my dad. And dad is one of those people that he doesn't take your word for it. He takes it at God's word. Amen. And so he went and he began to dig in. And it took him about a year to process and to study this. And he, he studied the Holy Spirit. And he studied the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he studied everything that he could find in Scripture about the Holy Spirit. And finally he came to a place one night. And he just knelt down. I was asleep in bed. My mom was asleep. And we were living in a little two-bedroom duplex apartment. And he just knelt down. And he just kind of positioned himself in this just openness before God. And he said, God, I don't understand the Holy Spirit. I've studied and I've looked. And I, I think I see some things. And I, but, God, this is really difficult. It's really confusing to understand. But, God, here's what I know and here's where I'm confident. Is that you're good. And everything that you have to offer your kids is good. And so if the Holy Spirit is something that's from you, I believe that it's good. I may not understand it all. I may not have all the answers, but it's good. Would you tonight fill me with your Holy Spirit? And I want everything that comes with the Holy Spirit. And that night, in our little apartment, not in a church service, not with someone yelling in tongues over him, not with someone waiting with a modesty cloth, not with someone waving the Holy Spirit upon him, um, not with someone screaming, let it go, and someone else screaming, hang on to it. Um, there wasn't any, there was just this, God, I want all that you have for me. Would you give me the gift of the Holy Spirit? And that night he received the gift and all that the Holy Spirit had to offer. And it changed the trajectory of his life, and not only his life, the life of my mother, and my life. Because without that moment, I don't think that I would be standing here today. And so I was privileged to grow up in a home with the Holy Spirit being normal and being something that was embraced, but yet we were not the weird family that was freaky and unrelatable to everybody. But we understood the power of God, and we knew who the Holy Spirit was and the Holy Spirit made us different, made me different than other people. And sometimes they did struggle to understand, why won't you do this? Well, I just I can't because there's something on the inside of me telling me you want to go this direction, but I need to go this direction. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples in the book of John. And he's saying, guys, I, I've been with you for three years, but my time has come. And I'm leaving. Now I want you to think about the person closest to you in this world and having that conversation. It's emotional. It's hard. It's difficult. You don't understand. Why do you have to leave? Why do you have to move? I don't, I don't like this. And so this is the conversation that Jesus, but Jesus said, listen, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. But I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God. And he's going to send someone called the advocate, the Holy Spirit, a comforter, who's going to come. And he's going to do what? He's going to lead and guide you into all truth. And, and Pastor Chad and I were talking about this the other day, and this is something we agree on. We believe that the gift of the Holy Spirit and everything the Holy Spirit brings into our life is the most important gift that God has given us, second only to the gift of salvation and Jesus on the cross. Amen. And I personally believe, this is, this is my personal interpretation of Scripture, that unless a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, they will not be able to complete or fulfill the potential that God's placed on the inside of them. You read in Ezekiel, and there's a chapter called the, the Valley of Dry Bones. And it says this. It says that the, val the, the dry bones begin to shake and begin to come together. Muscles are formed. Tendons are formed. Organs are formed. Skin is formed. And it makes the statement. It says they look alive, yet they sit there lifeless. 
And then, and then God says, Ezekiel, I want you to speak to the wind and tell the wind to enter the bodies. And it wasn't until the wind, which in the Old Testament is representative of God's Holy Spirit, it wasn't until the wind entered, the breath entered the body, that the body was able to stand and move in unison as a great army on behalf of God. And so I think we've got a lot of people that are saved, that are going to heaven, that have, have lived and, and accepted Jesus, but they're missing this powerful component where God says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you. Amen. That's some power, right? That's some power on the inside of the life of a believer. And, and Jesus is telling his disciples in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 that I'm going to send you. Matter of fact, look at this in verse 15 of, of John chapter 14. If you love me, obey my commandments. Not prove you love me by obeying me, obeying my commandments. Let your fact that you obey me reveal your love for me. In other words, the obedience to my commandments is going to be a reflection of your love for me. So love comes first, not obedience. All right? Okay, I just want to clarify that. It's a totally different message, but just want you to get that. And he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you. Now listen to this. He's lived with you, but later, what, what's the transition? He will step inside you. There's a big difference. There's a big difference of someone just being with you and trying to have leadership in your life from without to now stepping on the inside of you and leading you from within. There's a massive transition that happens there. And I just want to talk for a moment about the fact that the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. I have this message that I do often, and sometimes I'll have a table setting up here, and there's a little magic trick going on. I've cut a hole in the table. So if you ever see me now, you, you know the secret to my magic trick. But I've got a present setting on there. And I talk about the present, and I hold the present up. You can see all the sides of the present. The present is completely wrapped. And I like to talk about how we like to give gifts, and we like to give or receive gifts. And the thing about a gift is when it's given, you have to what? You have to receive it and open it. Because if you never receive it and you never open it, what's inside will never benefit you. And a lot of people have been given a gift by God, but they've just put it on the shelf in the wrapping paper and they've never received it and never opened it. And so it's not having any effect in their life. But when you open this present, I begin to pull things out. And it's like, you know, a little, little box, but I pull this massive shepherd's staff out of it. That's like, long as like, no way that fits in that box. And then I pull other things, and I'll pull like 20 things out of this box that there's no way those things fit in there. But that's a great description of the Holy Spirit, that he's a gift that keeps on giving. And God gives us this gift of the Holy Spirit, and he gives us so much more than what the church has reduced the Holy Spirit to, the gift of speaking in tongues. And that's one of the, we'll get there, we'll get there. The Holy Spirit gives us some things and gives us some stuff that really radically changes our life. And the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving. And I want to talk for just a minute about the two primary responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. The two primary responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. The first one is his primary responsibility is to build you up personally. To build your life personally. There is a personal advantage to having the Holy Spirit work in your life. It's kind of like an athlete taking performance enhancing drugs. It's an unfair advantage, right? There's a lot of controversy now with all of that. And, but when they take these performance enhancing drugs, they take something into their system that gives them an unfair advantage over someone that doesn't have this substance. And they've outlawed it and they've legalized it. Well, having the Holy Spirit in your life is like having an unfair advantage. It's like having an iPhone when no one else has an iPhone, okay? Uh, I often joke that the day I got my iPhone was just like the day I got filled with the Holy Spirit because it leads and guides me into all truth. Because um, it'll show me how to get home. It'll show me where I'm at. It'll show me what turns I need to take. It has this thing called Google that I can search, and it brings up information. It can bring me to an intersection at life, and it'll tell me to go left or tell me to go right or tell me to go straight or tell me to just sit still. It'll tell me when there's a traffic jam and when there's problems ahead. It'll tell me how to make a detour around problems. It's, it's all kinds. Of, and so the Holy Spirit is just like that working in our life. And his primary responsibility is to build us up personally. Well, how does he do that? Actually, let me go here. Let me go to the second thing and mention it. The second 
primary job of the Holy Spirit is to use you and to work through you to build up other people. So his primary job is to build you up personally and then to work through you to be used by him to build someone else up. And we're going we're gonna to dive into 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 here for just a few moments. We're going to kind of park there. And we're going to get into some things. But there's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, that gives us kind of the parameters for this. And I'm going to give you a filter, because this is really a, a great set of chapters to really understand the Holy Spirit. Because Paul is teaching a church that had been in a home, and there was just a handful of people. They were young, they were immature, and it says that every gift of the Holy Spirit was working in their midst. That they were working and, and being used in every gift of the Holy Spirit. Yet Paul is correcting them in these, these chapters. That he's teaching a church that has been used to being in a small, home, intimate environment that has now grown and is now meeting in public. And he's teaching them how to have church in public. And matter of fact, he says in one place at the end of chapter 14 in the New Living Translation, if you keep doing church like you've been doing it, people are going to come in and they're going to think you're crazy. And, and they're not going to feel at home. And because of your behavior and the way that you're representing God, you're going to become an obstacle that gets in the way of other people relating and building a relationship with God. So I want to bring some correction. And he, that's in the beginning of, of chapter 12. That's where he tells them, I don't want you to be ignorant about the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to be ignorant about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these three chapters are really key. And I'm going to give you a filter of how to read through these, these three chapters. And this is something that I've learned, something that I've seen, something that I've studied. And I believe this scripture in 1 Corinthians 12 gives us this indication. Here's the filter. Is that what Paul is teaching and talking about when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there are two different primary types of gifts that he's talking about. One of those is a personal gift that he gives to me to benefit me. It ties in with the first responsibility of the Holy Spirit for his primary responsibility is to build me up personally. The second type of gift that he gives is a gift of service that is not for me or for my advantage. It's for me to use to help somebody else. So there's two different types. Let's, let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are, what does he say? Different kinds of spiritual gifts. Now, we often just use that as, okay, well, that's the gift of prophecy. That's the gift of healing. That's the gift of wisdom. That's the gift of words of knowledge. That's the gift of healing and faith. All of those different things that are listed. But listen, there's two. He says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts. I believe, and I read, that's a personal gift that's given to you for your personal advantage. Now, let me clarify something here on this. God will not give me a personal gift that gives me an advantage that he will not give you. Okay? So these gifts are for everybody. And we're going to go through just a, some of those because God is no, has no favorites. And so he will give us all these personal gifts that work in and through us to build us personally. God will not give me an advantage that he will not give you. And then he goes on and he says, so there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service. In other words, there are different gifts that God puts in you to serve other people. But we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who works in all of us daily. And so we see this. And so while God will give us personal gifts that benefit me personally, and he gives us all access to these. He also gives us a gift of service, and he doesn't give everybody the same service gift. So this is where now we get into the breakdown in 1 Corinthians 12 of we need the body. The hand is different than the foot. The eye is different than the ear. Everything has a different function. And when we come together in unity and we celebrate each other's differences, instead of being jealous of each other's differences, or fighting each other over differences, when we come into a place of unity and harmony, now we can be effective in radically impacting a community. Because we're all working in our gifting. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God builds us up personally. Let's look at that. How does he do that? And I'm going to, my notes are available. I've, I've given them to the team here. So if you want some of these, because there's a lot of scripture references, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to be able to get into today. Um, but... If you want to look these up, study these, you'll, you'll be able to see some of these things. So the first one 
We find in John 14, verse 17, you can scribble these references down. And this is the first one. God leads us and guides us personally into all truth. That's the first way that the Holy Spirit builds up our life is to lead and guide us into all truth. Now, right just a few verses before, Jesus says this. What does he say? He says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So primarily, what is the Holy Spirit's way of building you up personally? Is to lead you to Jesus. Help you to understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on our behalf. And so that is the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. And when we understand all truth, when we understand Jesus, we understand Jesus' role in our life, when we understand our relationship with God now through Jesus, that makes us different. It makes us weirdly different when we understand the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us into all truth. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27... It says this, it says the Holy Spirit is your best teacher. He, matter of fact, let's look at this one. 1 John chapter 2, we'll start at verse 26. And he says, I'm writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. In other words, there are people in life, there are things in life, there are organizations in life, there are political parties in life that want to lead you astray. But you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches everything you need to know, and what He teaches is true, it's not a lie. So just as He has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. The Holy Spirit not only leads you, but He teaches you along the way. And He serves you in helping you understand. So there are things that we don't know. Matter of fact, one of the greatest jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring understanding he reveals mysteries. He doesn't create mysteries. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the whole thing is about understanding. And it's about clarity. Even at the, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given, they, they prayed in a language that other people understood the gospel of Jesus. It was, it's hard to explain. It's hard to understand. But that's what was happening. The, second, uh, the third thing that he does is the Holy Spirit works in our life, and he searches out all things. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 says this, But it was that God revealed these things by his Spirit, for his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. So the Holy Spirit is like your personal Google that will bring up a problem, a situation, and he will search out the right answer. So when you're in a season of transition, the Holy Spirit is a great gift to have in your corner because it'll give you direction, it'll give you peace, it'll give you a sense of, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going somewhere, and God, I know that you're leading me there. Amen? He also, at the end of that, in verse 16, says, For who can know the thoughts of God? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives us his way of thinking, Amen. his way of seeing people, his way of developing relationships, his way of doing business. The Bible says that pray this, my kingdom come, uh, or pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth that is in heaven. And God's kingdom has a way of doing relationship has a way of doing parenting, it has a way of doing business, it has a way of doing education. And those things are very different. They're weirdly different from the ways of the world. And so when we pray that, the Holy Spirit is God's greatest force to bring you the mind of Christ and the kingdom of God and allowing the will of God to be done in your life and through your life. John 16, 8 says this, that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us of our sin. It's not our pastor's job to chase down everybody's Facebook and say, hey, you, you, you got a sin problem. We don't need to tap your phones or look through your email or spy on you to see if you're sinning and bring it to your attention. A lot of times the church gets caught in trying to be the sin police that we forget to just love people. The Bible says that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sin, those things that will separate us. The Bible says that this sin has a wage, it's death. 
And God wants to put his finger on those areas of our life that are sinful because he knows now because of what Jesus has done, it won't separate us from him because Jesus has paid the full price. He's paid the price for our sins. But when we make a mistake, God knows that that sin still has a consequence, still has a price, and it can separate us from our spouse. It can separate us from our children. It can separate us from our purpose or our destiny. It can separate us from our church and our relationships. And so God wants to bring conviction into our life, not because he's angry with us, but because he loves us and he wants us to be full of life and everything that God has. He comforts us in struggle. The Holy Spirit does this in John 14, verse 27. Jesus says, I'm leaving you a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. So don't be troubled or afraid. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of, of, of racial rights, in the midst of tension, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of one of the craziest years any of us have ever experienced, we can, because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we can be a peace of mind and peace of heart. We don't have to be troubled or afraid because God is in us, leading us through the struggle. In the Old Testament, it says that God led his people through the wilderness a cloud by day and fire by night. There's a great picture and metaphor that God will lead us through the wilderness seasons of our life, through the difficulties of our life. He won't just comfort us in the midst of them. He'll lead us through them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is with me. And then, man, I wish I had time to dig into this one. He gives us a personal prayer language. I think this is one of the most controversial subjects and it's a lot of charismatic people have, have put their stake in the ground around this issue. And, and I've heard people teach that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not going to heaven. And that's just not true. Our prayer language is a personal gift that God gives us. And you can really dig into this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And there's some other places, Jude chapter one, verse 20. And our prayer language is a personal. Remember, there's two types of gifts. There's personal gifts that build us up personally. And there is a gift of a personal prayer language called speaking in tongues that the Holy Spirit, when he steps into our life, he gives us this gift. Now, maybe you've used this. Maybe you've received this gift and you use it every day. Maybe you've, you've never heard of that or maybe you've heard of it but you've never operated it in it and, and you're convinced maybe I don't have the Holy Spirit and maybe I'm missing something listen if you've done what my dad did and just said God would you give me the Holy Spirit you have the Holy Spirit and everything that comes with him so you have this gift the thing you have to get over is is this right here your human mind because first Corinthians 14 Paul tells us that our human mind does not understand our prayer language it doesn't make sense to us and that's the greatest obstacle for someone functioning in this. They think it should sound a certain way. They think they should understand it. But it is one of the ultimate steps of faith to pray something you don't understand, believing that God understands. And let me, this is the way that I define our personal prayer language. It is God in me, praying through me, praying for me, the perfect will of God. When I don't know what to pray, when I don't know how to pray, when I don't have the answers, I can pray in my personal prayer language, and I can have faith that that is God in me, praying through me, praying for me, the perfect will of God. Amen? Now, let me say this. It's personal, and it's private. This is Sethology here. As I read Scripture and as I distinguish chapter 14, because 14 tells us there is a public side to speaking in tongues. There is a gift of tongues that is for a public use. It is to serve and build up the church, but it is always be coupled with an interpretation. There's people that have the gift of public tongue, tongues, and there are people that have the gift of interpretation so that the, because the Holy Spirit wants to reveal a mystery, not create a mystery. So let me just tell you personally, you will probably never hear me pray in tongues. You'll probably now, I, I prayed in tongues this morning, I prayed in tongues during the service, but, but nobody here heard me. Matter of fact, if you hear me pray in tongues, you better duck and cover because something bad is happening. Like there's a tornado coming, there's an earthquake, there's a, 
a hurricane, there are terrorists that are taking over the church, or something bad is happening. Because I believe this is a personal gift. And 1 Corinthians 14 tells us when we do this openly and publicly, we actually create separation between people that don't understand what we're praying. And in the church, the last thing we want to do is create separation. We want to create unity and we want to pull people in. And we want to let them know this is home for them. And there's so many things that, that I'd love to just dig in there, but I don't have time. But your personal prayer language, it's not something that's difficult. It's not something, if you don't have it and you don't choose to use it, that's your decision. God's not mad at you. God's not upset with you. You're just missing a personal gift that God's using. You can give by yourself. And you can just pray and, and mumble stuff. And it doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't have to sound like what you've heard. It doesn't have to sound like what you've heard somebody else do. It can just be, God, I'm just going to, this is weird but I'm praying that this makes me weirdly different because I want to I want to I want you in me praying through me praying for me and there are a, a list of things that we could get into about how the, the Holy Spirit brings a personal gifts not just a gift gifts into your life that was the point that he's a gift that keeps on giving I would keep pulling out things and pulling and just when they thought I was done I would pull something else out and just when you think you have reached the bottom of the box, there's something else in the gift of the Holy Spirit that will give you a personal advantage and build you up personally. The second thing that the Holy Spirit does is He uses you and He gives you a gift of service to serve someone else, to build someone else up. You can see this through 12, 13, and 14 in First. Uh, 12 verse 7 he says a spiritual gift is given to each of us each of us there are some of you that have felt like maybe you've been left out of that but each of us have been given a spiritual gift so we can help each other and verse 8 through 11 in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us some different gifts and just it's not an exhaustive list but it's, it's a list of, of different gifts you can read that 1 Corinthians 13 tells us this, that our gifts are only effective when they operate in love. When your gift is more about you and people looking to you, you're using your gift the wrong way. But when you recognize Jesus said, or they say about Jesus, that he saw them, and he saw them in their need and in their brokenness, and he had compassion on them, he loved them. And he stepped into their world and served them. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit does, is that we see people that are broken and we have compassion and we are moved out of love to step into their world and to serve them. And there are so many things that we could, we could say there. You know, I, I love this. Whatever your spiritual gift is, it's really cool to know that, to learn that, to understand that. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, there's a great test you can do. In verse 4, it says, love is patient, love is kind, love is long-suffering, love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love doesn't rejoice in evil, but it rejoices when the truth wins out. And you can take your spiritual gift and you can put it in place of love and see if you pass that test. My gift of healing is patient. My gift of healing is kind. My gift of he healing keeps no record of wrong. My, my gift of healing doesn't rejoice when evil wins out, but it rejoices when truth. And you can, my gift of prophecy, my gift of wisdom, my gift of administration, or my gift of leadership, or my gift of greeting or hospitality is patient, is kind, is long-suffering. We've got to be a church and a people that function. The Bible, remember what the Bible says? Let me show you the greatest way, and it's the way of love. Because love will sacrifice for someone else's benefit. The Holy Spirit will make us weirdly different. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have to make us weirdly crazy. And I believe that Reach Church is going to be a church and is a church that reflects the goodness of God and helps people be drawn to a place of relating to Him, serving Him and loving Him and experiencing all of the life-changing benefits. And I pray today that there's just this posture in our heart, kind of similar to what my dad experienced, that we're just kind of open. Doesn't have to be a show, doesn't have to be a performance, doesn't have to be dramatic. You know, we receive the gift of salvation by faith and through God's grace. 
and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the same way. God, I, I may not have the answers and I may not understand everything, but the Holy Spirit seems to be from you. And if it's from you, I want it and I want all that it has to offer. And so I just challenge us today just to have that openness to say, God, would you make me weirdly different? Would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? I just, every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to give you an opportunity, first and foremost, to know Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He didn't say the Holy Spirit is the way, the truth, and the life. He says, I want you to know me, and then as you get introduced to me, I will introduce you to the Holy Spirit. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, as the leader of your life, I just want to give you this opportunity. We're going to pray here in a moment. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to pull you up. We're not going to make you give a speech. We're just going to pray. And I just, I pray I love this church. I love how responsive you are. I love how engaged you are. It makes preaching here so easy. I just want you to pray with me. Just repeat after me. And, and maybe you've said this prayer a hundred times. Maybe you've, but if, if this is your first time or, or maybe it's a rededication moment, I just want you to, there's nothing magical about the words that we say. It's what, what's magical is when our words reflect what our heart believes. So it says, when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, when we believe he went to the cross and paid the price for our sin, when we believe that he was resurrected on the third day, we believe that and we confess that with our mouth, that we are saved and we are adopted into the family of God. So we're just going to pray together. And I just pray if, if you've never prayed this prayer and you want this to be your moment of introduction to Jesus and the moment where you accept him as the Lord and leader of your life, just pray this with sincerity in your heart. And just repeat after me. Say, Father, today I come to you. I'm broken. I've made mistakes. There's something missing in my life. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross and paying the price for my sin. Today I ask you to come into my life to be the Lord to be the leader of my life. I surrender my life to you and I make a commitment to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, one last thing before we move forward. Just with that same attitude, that same heart of openness, maybe you've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Just would like you to, just everybody in the room, if you're comfortable with this, just put your arms open, kind of like you're going to receive something. I just want you to simply pray this, Father, give me the gift of the Holy Spirit and all that comes with Him. I may not have the answers, I may not know everything, but I know if it comes from you, it's good and I want it. Thank you for filling me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's give it up. Come on, man, man. I'm thankful that we serve a God who loves us. And he knew exactly what we would need along this journey. Don't do it alone. He gave you the advocate, a helper, a comforter. <laughs> he said, man, I know exactly what to do. When I go away to be with my father, I'm going to leave you with the very power you need to walk this out. And to walk it out victorious, not bound up. To walk it out free and not bound up. And just like he said in the last days, I'm looking for a church that will understand this thing called the Holy Spirit and operate in the very power that I've created for them. It is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead will live and work through you. Everyday, ordinary people. Man, he's good. Just stand to your feet for just a moment. Every week we want an opportunity, obviously, to pray with you and if the Holy Spirit's leading you and the Bible says that it's his goodness that draws people to repent because he's good. He loves you. He sent his son for you. But also each week we want to create an opportunity to pray with you because it's important that in a room this size, people are going through good things, bad things. They need prayer for promotions. They need prayer for anything and everything. We're on that list as well. And so if Becca and Heather will come up, and as the worship team just kind of goes back into this song for just a moment, 
If you need prayer for anything, we just want to take a few moments. I mean, I know that we're getting late, but listen, you don't put time frames on God moving, right? And whatever it is that you have in your life, let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us pray with you. Let us stand with you. I know every week we say prayer is important at our church, and that's why we have a connect card in front of you. But prayer is important to our church because we're family, and we care about you, and God cares about you more than we can. And he says, you know what, cast your cares on me because I care about you. And so as we go into worship for just a moment, we can stay for just a few minutes so people can get what they came to get. Amen? So as we go back into worship for just a few seconds, if you need prayer for anything, let's take a moment. And let us meet you where you're at and let us pray with you. Come on.
morning. off of us and are continuing to break off of our lives, that as we go to work tomorrow, Lord, we'd realize there's people with chains on their lives, and God, we would break them at our workplaces, that God, when we would be with our family this week, God, that we would realize that there's some chains on their lives, and we would be the army that rises up to break them off people's lives, that when the Holy Spirit checks us to call someone, we would call to get those chains broken off people's lives, that God, we would be an army that is rising up with your Holy Spirit and your power to go into our everyday lives and transform their lives with your power that you have put in our lives. God, I pray that we would be transformed, that we would be an army. Because, God, we don't just sing it. We know it, that there's power in your name and your name alone. And so, God, I pray that we, the church, would love people and be a representation of you. Your goodness, your grace, your forgiveness, your love that would draw people to you. So that their chains could fall. And they could live this life set free and free indeed. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, God is good. My goodness, I love what he's doing here. If you do not have a Bible, we want to tell you that on your way out the door, we will get one to you. Also, as we spoke on the Holy Spirit today, Pastor Chad wanted to make available those little books again. Uh, Gobo has some right there. So if you want one, uh, Pastor David E. I wrote a book a long time ago on the Holy Spirit. It's a really good book. It answers a lot of your questions. Uh, please grab one on your way out the door. Uh, man, we love you guys so much. If you have a teenager, we have youth here. Uh, our doors open at 5 o'clock. We are having our bus route, so we will pick your kids up from school and take care of them, feed them, give them Jesus, and then send them home to you. So, um, but uh, our doors open at 5 o'clock. Thank you for being here for your first time, guests. We loved having you. We hope to see you back next week. Give somebody a high five. Tell them it's good to see them. We love you, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for watching the Reach Church YouTube channel. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram. Hit the subscribe button and share this video with a friend. You can also support the ministry by visiting reachchurch.us give to help us continue reaching and equipping people. Thanks again for watching and God bless.